I had a checkup recently uh, at the doctor, and I, I, I had to tell them that uh, in my family, high cholesterol uh, kind of runs in our family, and so they've checked for that. I'm getting to the point where um, it's, you know, earlier in my life, it wouldn't have been as big of an issue, but now, now they're checking just to make sure and come to find out, yeah, I, I do have the same thing uh, running in my veins, and so uh, we're watching out for that and trying to figure out how to, I don't have any, you know, it's not affected me in any way so far, having high cholesterol, but, um, but Lydia wants to make sure I'm around as long as I can be for the kids, and so trying to figure that out. And who knows? Anybody here, I'm sure other folks have, have dealt with the same thing in their life. What are some of the things that are best for you in trying to keep a healthy heart? Avery, you know? Sleeping. Amen. It's a, that is one of the, uh, the main things. Make sure you get good, adequate sleep. That's a hard thing for me nowadays, but it's a, that's, that's a good thing. And we like, yes, you got it right. What else? What else do you do? Fish oil, okay? Exercise. You know, along with specifically fish oil, trying to keep a healthy diet, right? Make sure you're drinking enough. Make sure you're eating the right kind of stuff. Nothing fatty, nothing uh, that uh, uh, has too many saturated fats, that kind of, that kind of thing. What? Uh, eating lots of veggies. That's true. Making sure you're getting adequate sleep. They also say uh, making sure that your emotions are in check, too. If you've gone through traumatic things or if you're in really stressful situations, you might need to uh, find ways to manage that, even talk to a counselor. Now, now, we have actually, the last several weeks, as we've been talking about loving God with all of our heart, We've talked about that last category a whole lot. Going through things that are traumatic, going back and re revisiting the past and allowing Jesus to bring healing, allowing God to help you through mourning, allowing God to help you when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, these can be times that are of, of, of great stress. As we continue to, to talk about loving God with all of our heart, we're going to start talking about some of the spiritual insights that go along with uh, some of these same things that we've said this morning. What does it look like for us to have a good, healthy input spiritually to help our emotions, to help our heart. What does it look like for us to, uh, uh, to make sure we're exercising well in our faith? And today, we're going to focus on that very first thing that Avery shared with us very helpfully, sleep or rest. What does it look like for us to rest with God? So today, we're talking about the rest of the heart. And we're going to uh, do things a little differently this morning. I've done this before where we share a little bit. It's more collaborative. It's not just preaching. Uh, we're not quite doing the five-question model that I've done in the past where we will ask for our very first baseline thing. After I read the passages this morning, I'm going to have you all be able to share. Is there something you like, dislike, or find confusing about this text? But then we'll also use some of the, the ways that I've done this for our, our Wednesday morning Bible studies where we talk about the commands of Jesus because this is a command that we're going to be talking about. What is the context around some of this? What does it actually mean for us today? What's challenging about it? What makes it actually hard for us to live out? And then uh, um, how can we actually obey this better in our lives? So that's kind of the, the roadmap for where we're going to go today. I'm going to read us two passages this morning, both from the Old Testament. You'll notice that they seem very similar, but they'll also have some key differences there. So be looking out for that as we read. The first text for us this morning is in Exodus Chapter 20, and I will be reading uh, verses 8 through 11. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. The Lord says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Let's read again. We're going to be reading in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. The Lord said, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your animals, 
nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we reflect upon your text, uh, I pray that you would inspire us all. Might you help us to share insights with one another? Would you give us questions to ask? And in all of it, as we, as we discuss and share, and, and as I share the, the context and the insights that, um, that I have prepared, Lord, in, um, in seeking you in this, Lord, I, I, I pray that in all of this, we might come to a clearer picture of who you are and the blessings you have given us and the way that you have put out before us. So would you speak to us? We pray this in your name. Amen. So, Sabbath. Let's talk. What did you like? What did you dislike? What's confusing? You can share any one of those now. We aren't going to take them in any sort of order. Um, anyone? What did you like or dislike or find confusing? Anybody? Just from wherever you're at, you can raise your hand. You can speak it out. Lydia. I think it's confusing that God rested. Okay. Yeah. Why would God need to rest? That's a very interesting question but profound that he does. Profound that he takes a rest after the six days of creation and he stops, he enjoys, and he says that it's good. He asks us to do the same. What else? Bernice. Yeah. So don't like that it's hard to do, right? It seems like a nice concept, right? To, to just rest, to wait. But it seems also so hard to do because our world just keeps go, go, going all the time. I agree with you, Bernice. <laughs> what else? Anything you like, dislike, or find confusing? Kind of in line with from what you guys said, I like that it that God commands us to rest. What a, like out of all the commands that He gives in the Torah, that's a pretty nice one, right? Take a nap, <laughs> take a day off. I like that, that He gives that command. That's a good thing in and of itself, and I like the reason that He gives it us. Now, it may be confusing why He rested in the first place, but I like that He says, "I rested, and you should too," right? What else? Anybody else have anything they like? Pam, sorry. Yeah, that's a that's a um, part of it that we can sometimes overlook because we get so self-focused on things and what is it supposed to mean for me. But it has this kind of social impact to it as well that everybody is resting, and in their time too, you know, they had people working for them or anything like that. It's like you can't just have one person taking a day off and everyone else is continuing to do the work to make sure you're making uh, making enough money or, or producing enough en enough things. It's like, no, everybody has the day off. Everybody gets to rest. So I like that too. That's good. What else? Let's talk about the, the dislike or the confusing one. Those are ones that are sometimes hard for us to wrestle with in Scripture. Because we're like, are we allowed to dislike that? Or are we allowed to be confused by that? But it's, it's good because it helps us to unearth. Are there things that we need to understand better or come into alignment more? God on this. Anything that you dislike or find confusing? One of the things I, I dislike, and it's something that pops up a ton throughout the Gospels as well, is that there's definitely a, an element of legalism that can creep into this. Right? Ways that it can be used um, that kind of miss the heart and the spirit of the command in itself and, uh, and begin to actually make it more of a burden to rest and the freedom that it's supposed to offer and to, and to bring us into alignment with him. So I don't like the illegalism that we can uh, sense in there. But I also don't like that we don't do it so often, right? That it's, that it's hard for us to do it. What else? Emily. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, rabbis will actually talk about all of the Sabbath laws that come from the oral Torah as a mountain hanging by a thread. Because there's so little actually in the scriptural text to explain what it means to rest and to not work. Um, and yet it can mean so many things. You know, what, what is work? What does it mean to, to labor? Uh, I mean, it, as a mom especially, you know, like there's so many things to do. And, and what are we supposed to stop? And what are just the things that are like, well, I mean, this isn't like necessarily adding a burden to me. It's just the regular upkeep of things, right? So... So that's a, that's a confusing thing. It's a hard thing. Maybe a thing we dislike that maybe he should have been a little clearer, right, <laughs> on what he said. What else? Lydia. That's good. I'll give you five dollars later. I can't remember if I told you to cue that up or not, because uh, that's a gr- that's the great transition to the, the the next part of this that'll help us get into context. Because that's a great question that emerges from this. God gives this command about resting on the seventh day, and what's the seventh day? Saturday, not Sunday, right? And so, and, and throughout the, the other explanations of Sabbath, it also talks about it as a day of assembly, a day of gathering, and so. Jewish people, when they gather, they gather on Saturdays because that's the seventh day uh, in the week. And yet, we as Christians, we know that there's some dissonance for that because we're gathering not on Saturday, on Sundays, right? The first day of the week. So when did that change? Why had that happen? And so I'm going to go ahead and lead us into a time. I want to share some context with us here right now so we can kind of understand this a little bit more. Uh, What is the context and how does this shape our understanding of the text? I want to read a little bit more for us. Uh, in Exodus, in both chapter 19 and in 31, Pam helpfully uh, caught that I put the wrong verse on uh, on there for the second passage here. But um, let me uh, let me read for us here. Exodus 19, verses three through six, and I, I provided emphasis in the parts that are uh, that are necessary up there to draw us to. This is right at the beginning. The, what we read was from the Ten Commandments when. Moses had come down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments to give, but in chapter 19, he's getting ready to go. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasure, treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. This is important for us to understand that this covenant, all the commands that are given here, including the Ten Ten Commandments, they are being spoken specifically to the Israelites. That's important because while there are some commandments in there that are just moral teachings that really are applicable to everyone, there's also whole sets of commands that are given in here that are, are about making them a separate people from the rest of the world. He even says here, although all the nations are mine, I'm calling you to something specific. And so there are some commands that are given that specifically are about setting them apart as a nation of priests, as a special representation. And so there are ways that they live out things differently. In Exodus 30, um, or 31, Starting in verse 12, verse 13, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, again, it's specifically to the nation of Israel, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come, so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. So the purpose of Sabbath is not just to rest, although that is a, 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 obviously a huge component of it. It's the, what the actual content of it is. It's also to be a sign and a symbol that it is a special representation for Israel among all the other nations that they have a special relationship 
with God. It's a sign between me and you. Um, and we saw the reasonings for Sabbath separate in both of those commands. One was because God created the world in six days and on the seventh he rested. It's reflective of creation. The second one in Deuteronomy, it says, observe the Sabbath because I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt by my mighty hand and my outstretched arm. Uh, right? And so because of the Exodus, it's, it's reflective of that, that event in their history. You are to ob obey the Sabbath and to rest. That it's reflective of those two events. So then what changes for us, right? Or what's, 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 diff what's different about that? Because we also know this is in the Ten Commandments, which we generally take to be moral teachings, right? This is, uh, this is some within thing. How do we know what is moral and what is specifically for Israel? Well, let's turn to the New Testament. What changes with Jesus? In Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, uh, we see a, a conversation between uh, Jesus and the Pharisees, and they're asking about, why do, you, why do your disciples, why are they picking grain on the, on the Sabbath and eating? And, and he goes into an explanation talking about King David and how David and his friends did the same thing at one point. And then he says something really interesting. He says, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Right? So he refocuses here the point of the Sabbath. It's a sign. It's a seal. And it's ultimately about the covenant that is given for our good. The covenant is not about the details themselves, but it's about uh, remembering what God has done. We see throughout the rest of the New Testament, I'm not going to go through all of the references here, but if you're a note taker, uh, they should be up there. You can write them with, uh, in your bulletins or something. There's so many healings that are done on the Sabbath that Jesus shows it's about doing good for others. This is what this day is for. It's to rest. It's to remember. It's, it's about restoration. It's about creation and recreation and liberation. And so uh, there are certain things when we think about what are you supposed to do and what are you not supposed to do. That's what they have arguments about in the Gospels that Jesus says one of the things that we absolutely can say you should or can do is to help other people, is to do good for others and all of that. But that doesn't completely answer the question for us yet. Because we see Jesus and the rest of the disciples and Paul even throughout the book of Acts, we see them again and again go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. It says, as was their custom, which is an important uh, phrase because, one, it shows that they continued to do it. It also labeled it as a custom, right, not as a commandment or law. But they did continue to do that. But we also see three other things happen throughout the New Testament. The first thing we see in the book of Acts, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, uh, and I don't remember how much I put on the slides here. The first thing that happens, though, is that they begin to meet not just on the seventh day, but daily. If you remember Acts uh, 2, verses 46 through 47, they're, they're meeting daily, they're sharing everything, they're, they're breaking bread with one another. They are actually treating almost every day as a sort of, uh, of special day and gathering the Sabbath because they believe that Christ has inaugurated a new kingdom reality. It's a new covenant that they're living into. Another thing that happens is there, there starts to become a special emphasis that's given to the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection specifically. We know that when uh, that the resurrection happened on the first day of the week and, and there's a few instances where Paul is meeting with believers specifically on the first day. And it doesn't say exactly why, but we get a sense that it's set apart different from the rest of the days of the week. We also see that as Gentiles flood into the church, it's specifically discerned that they do not need to take on the laws of ritual purity. We see this happen in Acts chapter 15 uh, as they have the Jerusalem Council and try to decide, all right, these Gentiles are coming to faith. Do they need to just become Israelites? Do they need to become Jewish so that they can follow Jesus well? And they specifically decide as they have seen the Holy Spirit fall upon these Gentile believers already, that he's already indwelt in them. God has not shown any sort of judgment on them uh, beforehand to, to become Jewish before he can indwell in them, so why should we put that on them? And so uh, they specifically make the judgment that it is not necessary for, for Gentiles to follow the ritual law code, um, even as they do follow the moral teachings. God. 
There's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that shows that, and the inclusion of the Gentiles. And so because of that, both Jew and Gentile Christian alike find salvation by grace through faith. And both are empowered to a life of obedience as an expression of that faith through the Holy Spirit. For the Jewish believers, the Jewish brethren, they're empowered to obedience to the law that God gave in the Torah and remembrance of all that God, God has done for and with the nation of Israel. And Gentile Christians are empowered to obedience to the moral teachings of the Torah and the law. Everything that was repeated by Jesus, Jesus repeats much of uh, the moral teachings. And not only that re repeats them, but heightens them, deepens them, widens them, fulfills them through his life and his teaching. So that gets us to the question of, well, what does it mean for us today? For those of us who are not Jewish Christians, who are Gentile Christians, what does it mean for us to wrestle with this text in Exodus and Deuteronomy and these teachings what does it mean for us to live this out? I would draw out for us that just as for the Israelites, it was reflective of creation. It was reflective of exodus and their liberation from bondage. It taught them about trust. It taught them about justice among one another. For us, it's about resurrection and recreation, which is why Sunday is so important to us. It's why the church started calling it the Lord's Day on, on the first day of the week because we remember that event that was so pivotal in our salvation history. It's reflective of our own liberation from sin and the bondage that it, that it gives. That's our exodus. And it's still about trust and his provision. It's still about others and, and, and how we uh, think about justice among one another. The good news of Sabbath rest is that it both recalls and reinforces Christ's victory over sin. That's the good news of this at the heart of Sabbath. So, in whatever day or whatever form that takes, what it means is that we ought to build some sort of intentional rhythms of rest into our life in a way that honors Christ as our source of provision, in a way that recalls the resurrection in our lives, in a way that helps to loosen the grip of sin on our hearts and in our spirits, and that somehow passes that same blessing on to others. Many of us remember a day when everything was closed on Sundays, right? And so it wasn't just a personal thing. It was a, a community-wide thing, a social thing, that everyone was able to rest, right? There wasn't an expectation or a need to work on that day. Um, it, and it was about giving glory and honor to God, but it was also about experiencing the rest of God uh, in our hearts and in our lives, right? That's harder to do today. But we see that there's still a value in it in some way, even to live counterculturally to do that. So, given that, given the context, given the meaning, what are the challenges? Bernie's already shared a little bit, lives are busy, right? What I'd like to hear from some other people, too. What are some challenges in our days right now that make it hard to really invest in this idea of Sabbath rest? Wherever you're at, you can speak. Any thoughts, any insights? My wife and I have tried to do some more things with Sabbath rest in, in our lives and one of the things that's really hard, uh, not just resting yourself, is, is actually trying to take into account not putting work on other people. And so whether they work or not, it's kind of up to them, but saying we're intentionally not going to go out to eat, we're intentionally not going to go somewhere, anything that is causing another person to work, um, so that we can say we're, tr we're trying to actually uh, help live into that reality as much as we can, we think. That's a hard thing to do. When you're trying to rest on a day, you're like, I don't really want to make a meal, so let's just go out to eat. That, that'll be simpler to do it that way. Or, you know, it would be really fun to have a restful day with the kids. Let's go out to the zoo. That means someone else is going to have to work. That's, you know, there's things like that, that that become hard to do, right? What other things are challenging for other people? Anybody? Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm 
Yeah. Yeah, so there's uh, so many families that have, you know, sports leagues for kids that do things on Saturdays or Sundays, um, or re- almost every day of the week. There's so much going on to choose from and so many good things. And it's hard to draw the lines, the limits. Where, what, am I gonna, what are we going to say no to in order to say yes to rest? That is a hard decision to make. What else? What else is challenging? Fred. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so for most of us who are seeking recreational activity, you, know, you have so much work during the times uh, of the week that you're like, everything just gets filled up on the weekends and any free, spare or free time that there is. And so that can be a hard thing to do, to manage the, there's no gap <laughs> in between in any of it. So, so what do you find time to rest? I think another challenge for us as well is uh, society does at least give lip service to this idea of, of rest and of self-care. Have you heard this before? This idea that, hey, we need to be taking care of ourselves. We need to rest. Um, but even that kind of misses the mark on what's talked about biblically of Sabbath because that all becomes very self-focused rather than the idea of, of Sabbath, which is God-focused and others-focused. Right? This idea of just ceasing activity, not just trying to make sure that you're pampered and feel good. There's a place for making sure that you're taken care of, but it's an actual just ceasing, just stopping in order to remember the things that God has done, in order to think of others before yourself, in order to to not strive for more and more. It's a very countercultural idea. Almost everything in our life tells us the opposite messaging. And I don't know about any others who, who have maybe tried this. It's, it's hard even just to practice the self-care stuff. You start to feel selfish. And then to go the level beyond that, to just cease and to do nothing, at least in self-care, it feels like it's productive because you're trying to pour into yourself so that you can be better for the other things. To just do nothing it is unproductive, which feels like a sinful word to our culture, right? To, do, to have nothing to show for the rest that you've done. But that's the, what God has called us into. Not to have anything that's to show for anything, but just to be with him. So, those are the challenges. But how do we do it? How do we embrace this in any sort of helpful way? How do we better love God with our, all our heart through Sabbath rest? Anybody have any suggestions? What has worked for you in the past, if anything? Let's, let's kind of share with each other and help us to all better understand how we can live this out. Any thoughts? Planning ahead. Say more about that, Lydia. Yeah, we're way more likely to go out to eat if we haven't actually... Uh, taking time to prepare what we would actually eat on a day off if we would do that. And so we, we have not done this perfectly in our own life, but we, we've tried to, to figure out how to do this more intentionally with our family. And so Friday night's become a night of like, all right, we're going to have our meal ready for us, but we're also going to sit down and make our plan for tomorrow so we can actually just rest. And we choose Saturday uh, not as a sort of legalistic because we think that's the only day it, it ought to be, but for as, as a pastor's family, I'm working on Sundays <laughs> sometimes. And so, uh, so that if that's a really good day for us to, to choose and to do that. Uh, but we plan ahead to try to carve out that time. Deacon. Yeah. Thinking ahead to plan. Just like Mommy said, you're right. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else? Things that, ha- that you've learned from resting, things that have 
have been helpful for you? Any insights? Oh, that's a child talking. <laughs> it's like I thought I heard someone calling my name. By a, a show of hands, who feels like they ha have done this well in their life? Anyone? A lot of people feel like they're struggling, right? It's a hard thing to rest. Um, in fact, a lot of people, you know, as Christians, we tend to say, okay, we are celebrating Sunday as our Sabbath in that sort of way. Most uh, Jewish people, whether they are uh, Messianic Jews, Jewish believers, or, or not, they are like, no, Christians do not do Sabbath. <laughs> they do not rest. Uh, and bec it's because in, in many ways we have swung to the other side of the pendulum. We've said, hey, we don't want to be legalistic about this thing. We have been, uh, we've found uh, freedom and grace in Christ, and so we, we want to embrace uh, living in the new covenant, and we have lost the value of what God has given us. We've lost what's so wonderful about this, that when we rest, it actually helps our heart. It actually it, That's the release valve for us. It's the sleep. It's the rest that we get. And then we wonder why we feel so anxious. We wonder why we feel we have those things that are like, you know, uh, when it comes to high cholesterol stuff, I was sharing about that earlier. I was trying to look and research. I was like, all right, I want to know more about this. And so are there little symptoms that I need to be aware of that could be cues that I, I need to take stuff? And all of the things I was reading were like, no, it's just the emergency events that you find out, <laughs> like that you haven't been doing well. And so it, it's the same thing sometimes for spiritually, though. Sometimes it, we're like we're going and we're doing sporting events on Saturdays or on Sundays. We're never taking an actual day off of rest. And it feels like we're doing all right. And then a major stressor happens. And we're like, I have nothing to draw from. I've given myself no margin. A pandemic hits, right? Or some traumatic thing happens. You lose someone in, in your family. Um, some really hard thing happens at work, so you, you've kicked into overdrive for things. And when you already weren't resting, now you're really not resting, right? When we have no margin, when we have forsaken the gift and the command that God gave in rest, then we realize how unhealthy we are. <laughs> we realize how we haven't been giving ourselves that resource. And so planning, preparing, that's an important thing. It's not fun to do, but it, it's so worth it. Actually trying to make sure in your rest that you are remembering God, not just, not just napping. Napping is a great thing to do when you rest. But beyond that, also taking time to say, I'm just going to read God's word. I'm just going to pray. Spend some time to actually connect with him. Remember what Christ has done for me. Resting in a way that actually frees us from striving. One of the ways I did this in college was, uh, um, again, it was a Saturday thing. I would find that uh, as I approached the weekend, I would always think, oh, I got this paper due. Oh, I have this other project I need to work on for things. I need to make sure I get progress done this weekend. I need to do that on Saturday. Saturday would come, and you know what would happen? I would not do any work on that paper. I would not do any work on any of those things because stuff would come up with my friends, and we would go want to go out and do something fun, and I would choose that because like, I can maybe get to it later, but it would always be in the back of my head. I got this project. I got this paper, and so I'm not actually enjoying the time that I was spending resting. I'm not actually living in the moment. I had made a commitment my senior year to say, you know what, I am actually going to try to take some time to rest. So in the time when I am actually not getting anything done anyway, I'm just going to do it intentionally and say that's a day of rest. I'm intentionally not working on my paper today. I'm intentionally not working on a project. And then you know what happened? All of a sudden I was free on that day. I'm going to do that on Sunday. This is the day that I'm resting, that I'm enjoying. That I and so I would count anything that was my regular work. Anything that was like, if I had to work in the Eagles landing where I, I worked at, a t or no, I worked in the writing center. I was like, all right, obviously I'm not going to schedule myself for that time, or, or I'm not going to work on any papers. Those things that were like usual work, I didn't do on that day. It didn't mean that I wasn't going to do other things that came up, or uh, it actually meant too, I didn't make any plans to go with anyone to anything on Saturday. If someone that day said, hey, do you want to go do this thing? Yeah, sure, I'll go do it. But I didn't make plans for that day because I wanted it to be free. I wanted it to be a day of rest. That's just a thing you can do, a way you could embrace it in that way. To free yourself from having to be productive and planning on that day. 
So make sure that you're trusting in God's provision. That's a way you can embrace it. So uh, to close this out today, as I was reflecting on this a little bit with Lydia last night and, and, and talking more about Sabbath, uh, one of the things that came to, to mind for us was uh, um, just those precious moments that occurred right after any of the kids were born. Like the, the moments right after uh, birth where we practiced just some skin-to-skin time with the kids. Uh, Lydia usually first, uh, and, and then myself, I get to hold and, and cuddle, cuddle our kids. And there's uh, and a lot of contemporary research about, uh, about that. They say that skin-to-skin time is so important because it helps to regulate. And Lydia could speak to this so much more, uh, so much better than I could. But it, it, it's really healthy for the child and also for the mother um, and for the father to spend time in connecting and bonding with your kid. But it also can correct a lot of things that might go wrong. If, you know, if, if a baby has a fever or if there's anything going on with the heart rate, it can actually regulate that. Like as they are uh, with skin to skin, just resting in that way with the parent, it helps to regulate things. And I thought that was such an amazing picture for us for thinking about the way that we rest with God. I imagine even beyond the newborn life, uh, any of my kids, when they're anxious and they're crying and they're upset, and that feeling, that wonderful feeling that I, I have of holding my kids and they're crying or sobbing or thrashing, and then as we're just, they start to feel my chest go up and down. I try to be intentional about slowing down my breathing, and then their breathing slows down. You can feel their heart really anxious, and their heart rate slows, heart rate slows down. And they just kind of melt into my chest. It just regulates. And I feel like that's what God is calling us to do, right? I imagine that's what God desires for us in real Sabbath rest, that our hearts might melt into his, right? That we embrace that as a gift to help us to regulate. Because we really cannot get through the difficulties of this life without him. We just can't. Lord, I want to thank you because you are so good. I thank you because in your wisdom, in your wisdom, you gave us a pressure release valve, a command to rest. You gave us the opportunity to remember and to trust in you. And that we can. Because when we, when we stop, You do provide. You give new mercies. You work in miraculous ways that are just so out of anything we can imagine. So we don't need to figure it all out for ourselves. But we can just melt into you. So help us to rest, Lord. When our hearts are anxious. When all we can do is worry about the next day. Help us to rest. I pray that in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.